Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today filming in Malta uh, through the generous invitation of AMAX, the Association of Maltese Arms Collectors and Shooters. And we've put together some guns from a number of private collections here on Malta to do some video on. And today we're going to take a look at an MKB 42 W. That's the Walther version. It was the competitor to Hainel's prototype Sturmgewehr, and well this is the one that didn't make it through trials. So I think by the end of this video you'll really see why it didn't. So let's talk about first where this originally came from. So development on a short cartridge, an intermediate style of cartridge, had been going on in Germany beginning really in the mid to almost early 1930s. There were some uh, experimental designs, predominantly ones by uh, Vollmer, that didn't really lead anywhere. There wasn't a lot of military acceptance of this idea until after World War II started. And uh, the contract for these guns was actually issued in January of 1941. Um, the, the German military had a number of requests for an intermediate caliber select fire rifle like this, and they, they'd been working on this actually first with the Hainel company, and a company called Gecko had been doing most of the cartridge development. And um, so Hainel had a bit of a, an early start on getting the gun designed and working with the cartridge, designing the magazine and those sorts of features. Walther decided that it also wanted to get in on this, uh, and it thought it could enter a competitive design. What Walther had that Hainel didn't was a good experience with stamped sheet metal. Walther had been working on a semi-auto uh, 8x57mm self-loading rifle, uh, kind of uh, similar in concept to some of the elements of this, in particular the, the main disassembly lever. In fact I have a video on one of those Walther prototypes, the A115 design, and if you're interested in this you should also go check out that video as well. But uh, Walther had experience doing this sort of sheet metal stamping, and that was one of the main uh, characteristics of these rifles that the German military was looking for. They didn't have a lot of deposits of some of the, the trace elements necessary to make good high quality forged steels uh, within Germany. And with a war going on, importing that sort of raw material was more difficult, and what they wanted to do was come up with weapons designs that could be made with a stamped sheet metal that required less of these somewhat exotic alloying elements. So Walther had experience with the sheet metal, uh, and they thought that would make up for uh, their, uh, their, their late entry into the program. So they went ahead and put together this guy. Uh, it is semi-auto, well it's select fire actually, uh, semi-auto and full auto. It uses an annular gas piston wrapped around the barrel, which is unusual. Uh, it then has a rotating bolt, which is less unusual, but really kind of an unusual system of, of how this whole thing goes together. So. Uh, let's just go ahead and dig in and start taking this apart and show you how it works. Well we'll start with a general overview here. Um, not a whole lot of controls that we need to take a look at. We have a safety selector here, so F for fire, S for safe, well for Seeker and Feuer in German. On the other side of the gun we have the actual selector switch, so E is for Einzelfeuer, and D is for dower fire. So this is full auto, E is semi-auto. So you have the two different two switches uh, or two levers, one on each side of the gun to split the task of safe and fire selection. We have our model designation right on the side of the, the receiver there, MKB42W for Walther, that's machine and carabiner. And then we have the manufacturer marking here, uh, AC was the code for Walther, it is manufactured in 1942, serial number is 97, and then this thing uh, is from when this was an, this was an early NFA registered gun uh, in the United States actually before it came here to Malta, and so it was actually registered with an IRS number, um, which you will see done from time to time, and that's, that's why you've got that really goofy, ugly. The magazine release button is a big one on the side. This is way too far forward uh, to be used from a firing grip. However, the way that this was intended to be done was when you're holding the gun right-handed, you grasp the magazine with your left hand, push the button, and pull the magazine out. Uh, the, this would continue over onto all of the standard Sturmgewehrs, and that was how they're meant to be used. 
One unique feature of the Walther gun is that it actually had a magazine hold open. So when you fired the last shot, there's a tab on the magazine follower here that will actually activate a device and lock the bolt open. Uh, the the Hanel guns and the later Sturmgewehrs did not have this. The magazines are in fact completely interchangeable. This is our Walther magazine, this is our later Sturmgewehr magazine. Um, the, the, the Walther ones added this little tab, but they had that tab traveling in the back rib of the magazine, which was already there as part of the manufacturing process. So you can use standard magazines in the Walther gun, uh, and you can use Walther magazines in the standard Sturmgewehrs, you just don't get the hold open capability. You can see the magazine markings here, MKB-42. You will also find Hanel MKB-42 magazines that were made for their uh, original early open bolt guns, which do not have the, the hold open feature. The rear sight tower is very much like that of a standard Sturmgewehr. Uh, this was designed with the, uh, the idea of having the bore directly in line with the shoulder, and you can see that if we take a longer view of the rifle. You can see that the line of the bore is coming right in here, right through the top of the stock, uh, and thus you need to have elevated sights so that when you put your face on the, on the stock, when you have a good cheek weld, uh, the sights will actually drop right in line uh, with your eye. And they do that very well, as does the Sturmgewehr. These little stamped rails, or ribs, on the side of the front sight tower were done for mounting a, a ZF-41 uh, long, long eye relief optical sight, a, a sort of a designated marksman's optic, the exact same scope that was used on some of the very early Sturmgewehrs, as well as the Car 98K, and in theory the Gewehr 41. Uh, in practice, they found that this was not a, uh, a suitable mounting position. Uh, in fact, this one doesn't even have, and I don't think most of the, the Walther guns have, a notch cut to lock the optic in place. Uh, they found when they were testing these on the Sturmgewehrs later that you could zero the thing, and if you then dumped a magazine in full auto, you would completely lose your zero. So it just wasn't a sturdy enough mounting point. You will see occasional photographs of these and other guns with ZF-41s mounted on them. They look really cool. Uh, a lot of the, the collectors who do have these guns are, are usually quite interested in getting uh, the, the scopes to mount on them because they look awesome, but they were never really used uh, in combat because they just weren't practical. Front sight is hooded. Um, you'll notice you actually have a pretty short, uh, for the overall length of the gun, you have a pretty short uh, sight radius on these guys, but uh, bayonet lug, sling swivel, all the, all the kind of the standard components out here. We do have a rather interesting design to the handguard with these ventilation slots that are actually pointing forward. And I kind of suspect because you actually have a gas piston operating right in here, I suspect they were trying to get some sort of pneumatic system going where when the gas piston went backward it would suck air through in, in these vents and uh, when the bolt reciprocated forward, uh, it would push air back out to aid in cooling. I don't know how well that worked, but I suspect uh, that was their goal. And so they're only on the top, they don't cover the bottom. All right, now, taking it apart, this is going to be the fun part. Uh, we have two very German-style pins here, and we have actually left them just slightly pressed in so they're a little easier for me to get out on camera. We're going to flip this over, pull both the pins out. There's one. Here's the other. Those are captive pins, they don't have to come all the way out. Once those are out, then we can remove the trigger pack, like so. The next major step in the disassembly procedure is to open up this disassembly plug, lock, catch thing. So this rotates 180 degrees. There we go. We'll pull that around, and it's going to drop down. Uh, this is the part that is very similar to uh, the A115. So once that's down, then we can pull the whole upper assembly off the gun, like so. That is going to leave us with a stamped sheet metal receiver with a couple of heavy metal blocks built into it. Primarily this support here at the front to attach the front half of the gun. We also have a reinforcing block here for the magazine well. And then on the inside, this tube is actually the, uh, the mainspring of the gun, and that whole tube reciprocates backwards. There is a little cutout in it right up here at the front to give clearance for the hammer, because this is hammer-fired. We'll touch on this again in a moment. 
on second thought, actually, let's do that right now before I take this apart any farther. So what we have here is our, our actual bolt right there, which is riding in this sort of carrier, which is attached to this top. This is actually this is actually sort of the gas piston, uh, the operating rod, I suppose, is this. It doesn't look it's not in the typical form of a rod, but that's what it is. And then these two pins are holding in place this, which carries the bolt. You can see that tube very clearly right here, cycling backwards. And then this thing sticking out the back right there, that's the firing pin. So once it's closed, the hammer can swing up right into there, hit the firing pin and, and fire the thing. The recoil spring itself goes back into the buttstock here. The next step is to take the bolt and barrel assembly out of the front receiver section. That is actually held in place by the muzzle nut there. Uh, on the Sturmgewehrs, the muzzle nut doesn't really do a whole lot except protect the threading on the muzzle. On this, it actually has a legit purpose. And what's kind of cool is we can actually use a Luger tool to slide in here. Well, I can show you this from show you this from the front. There's a little wire spring right there. There you can see it wobbling back and forth. That locks into one of these notches and prevents this from unscrewing. So if I can use a Luger tool in there to lift that spring up out of the way, then I can very easily unscrew the muzzle nut. And then this guy just slides off. There we go. So there's the barrel assembly. This is just a very uh, complex piece of stamping with a couple metal uh, bits riveted onto it. The front sight block, uh, the bayonet lug, the stacking rod, etc. Now I mentioned that this is basically the operating rod. The way that works is because this is the gas piston itself. It's normally going to rest right up here. There are a pair of gas vents in the barrel, one on top and one on the bottom. And when you fire, gas is going to blow out of those. It's going to fill this little uh, section right here inside that sheet metal handguard, which is going to force this piston puck backwards. That impinges on this uh, piece of molded steel, which pushes this back and cycles the bolt. So pull this all off now, like so. There's our op rod and bolt, and the firing pin already fell out because there's this is held in place by the recoil spring. Once you take this assembly off, the firing pin can just plop out the back. And then we have our barrel and barrel extension, I guess you would call it right here. This ejects out the top, so we have a cutaway there. This guy is the ejector itself. This is the magazine hold open, so that's what gets pushed up. Uh, let's see, this piece gets pushed up by the follower, which then uh, causes the bolt carrier to lock in the rearward position. We have a couple more markings on here, pretty much what you would expect. Serial number, uh, Waffenamp, and a military proof mark. And then very interestingly, we actually have two manufacturer's codes on the barrel, BYS and CXM. So the BYS is a company called Ruhrstahl, uh, and they were a barrel maker for the Car 98K. They would eventually go on to also be a barrel maker for the Sturmgewehrs, so their association here makes sense. They would have made probably the barrel blank, because CXM... Uh, oh, and I should also point out uh, the Waffen, Waffenamp code in there, uh, 26, is actually the code for uh, Mauser Borsigwald, uh, which is odd, and I can't fully explain that. Uh, however, uh, CXM is Gustav Gensho, or Gecko, so they were one of the companies heavily involved in uh, the ammunition production and development, and so perhaps this barrel went to them for chambering early on. Um, that's the best explanation I can come up with.
And now our last major component is the op rod and bolt and bolt carrier assembly. So of course the handle is permanently affixed on. We have our firing pin which just slides in the back here. We'll go ahead and pull that out because there's nothing holding it in, so it's just going to fall out sooner or later. This is then a rotating bolt, and we have a cross lug, kind of like an AR-15, sort of, uh, that allows this to rotate and lock. Now there is also a safety mechanism built in here, and it's going to be a lot easier for me to show you this after it's disassembled. Uh, these look like rivets. They are actually just uh, sort of studs, and if I push them in, I can actually push this whole assembly out of the op rod. There we go. We have this little guy that falls out when you do that. Uh, this is an ideal thing to have in the gun when you're disassembling it in the Russian winter, I'm sure. All right, so there's what we have all told. Uh, our bolt with its cam track, and then this is the actual camming piece. You'll notice it has a hole for the firing pin, so the firing pin keeps it lined up, and as this travels it's going to require the bolt to rotate just slightly. Not much. Your, your total rotation is only about that much, which is just enough for the locking lugs here to engage and disengage. Uh, let's see, this, actually, this is the proper orientation in the gun, slot for the ejector in the bottom, extractor in the very top, and then these are your locking lugs. Now this slot on top of the bolt is where this little spring-loaded piece goes. That is a little plunger spring right there. It's going to sit in here, and the purpose of this piece is to prevent the firing pin from going forward before the bolt is all the way into the bolt, the barrel extension. So uh, the way this works is a little bit complicated. Basically, it's going to act as a stop on this carrier. This guy, let's see, the firing pin can only go so far into the cam piece right there because the diameter stops it. So for the firing pin to protrude through the face of the bolt, this cam pin has to be far enough forward. There you can see it right in there. This cam pin has to be basically all the way forward in its cam track, which means it has to have rotated the bolt. So that's a good safety mechanism. The, the lugs have to be fully engaged before the firing pin can come through. That, that all seems fine. The problem is, what if, say, you run into a, an obstacle before the bolt has come all the way into this section of the barrel extension? Well, what if the, uh, this thing rotates, the firing pin comes through, and detonates a cartridge while the bolt's back here? That would be a catastrophic failure and that's where this piece comes in. It prevents that from happening. So if I assemble this together, there we go. So what we have under normal operation, we have the little angled section right here, which is going to hit this corner of the barrel extension, and that's going to cause it to go down. And only at that point can this, this carrier come through on top over it, force the bolt to rotate, and then allow it to fire. Once this starts to come back, snick right there, that pops up. The bolt is then forced to unlock and come backwards. And here now, this carrier can't go forward because it's being blocked by this spring-loaded piece. So a little bit complicated to explain, but hopefully that makes sense. Right there. Once we get to this point, then this gets pushed down, and then this lug is kind of already controlled here. And in order for the firing pin to go forward and fire, the, the bolt has to be rotated because of this cam piece and its locking. Travel right in there. So our last piece to take a look at is going to be the fire control mechanism. This is kind of the, the classic German self-contained removable fire control unit. Uh, it is a hammer-fired gun, so let's see. On safe, where we have it right now, we have a little bar right, right here that is going to prevent me from lifting 
the back end of the trigger, which prevents any of the rest of this mechanism from operating and prevents the hammer from dropping. Once I put this onto safe, or onto fire, and by the way, this works much more smoothly when it's actually in the gun. When I have the, the mechanism out, I kind of have to do it by hand. But uh, once we have it on fire, you can see that this bar is cammed backwards, like so. And now, when I pull the trigger, we have kind of the classic two sears right there. I'm going to lift that up, and it drops. So not a whole lot to get into in the mechanism of the, fi the firing group. Uh, note that there is uh, a torsion style sort of hammer spring there. This is all held together with little tiny clips and pins, and there is no way that I'm going to disassemble this piece. So uh, that's as deep as we're going to get into it today. It is interesting to note, however, that the whole trigger uh, housing mechanism is made of stamped sheet metal. So you can see the piece here at the front where they've taken two layers, folded them across, spot welded them together, slap a couple of wooden grip panels on it, and you're ready to go. One other thing actually to point out, this guy right here is this the full auto trip. So if you have this set to full auto, uh, what's going to happen is it's not going to immediately, it, it is going to hook the hammer when the bolt cycles back, um, because you don't want the hammer to just follow the, uh, the bolt carrier. And then something has to push this down, and when you do, that releases the hammer in full auto as long as the trigger is being held. And the thing that does that is this little triangular protrusion on the back of the op rod. So this is going to be cycling forward here, it's going to get to the end of travel, and it's going to push that lever down, which is going to then release the hammer once the bolt's fully in battery and locked and ready to fire. And there you have the complete Walther MKB42W. Uh, disassembled. Uh, this would be the full field disassembly, and I think this is going to give you some notion as to part of the reason why this didn't make it through field trials. This is a lot more complicated to take apart, and in particular a lot more complicated to put back together, most notably this stuff, um, than, than what Hainel had designed, which would become the Sturmgewehr. So, uh, in fact, this is really quite a pain in the butt. To, to put back together that bolt system and that spring-loaded little safety uh, device. One almost has to wonder if that was an afterthought, if it wasn't in the original design, and someone realized uh, during early trials that they needed a way to prevent uh, out-of-battery firing beyond what was already built into the gun. Um, that is possible, but I don't, I'm, I'm speculating here, I don't have any actual documentation to suggest it. Ultimately, when this actually got into testing, the, like I said, the contract was for 200 guns. It's assumed that 200 is the total production. I've never seen any documentation of guns numbered any higher than 200. Um, I don't think anybody else has either. There's no definitive proof that that's exactly how many made, but given that that's the contract, it seems like a safe assumption. Uh, at any rate, once they went into testing, they had a number of, uh, of problems. Uh, they're obviously more complex. Then Hanel's gun, uh, which became the MKB, which was the MKB-42H. Uh, they're more complex, they're more expensive to make, they were less reliable. Uh, I have been told by people who have shot these that you get a lot of gas blown back into your face, which isn't very pleasant. However, these did have a couple of advantages over Hanel's product. Namely, they, were, they offered closed bolt fire for semi-auto, um, which was, as a practical matter, more accurate. Uh, Hanel's gun, the original MKB-42H, was an open bolt gun. And also, the fact that they were a closed bolt meant it was uh, less susceptible to dirt and crap getting into the gun. Hanel's gun was much more like a submachine gun. If you, were, if you wanted to be ready to fire, you had to have the bolt locked to the rear, because it fired from an open bolt. That gave you this big space in the side of the gun where dirt could get in. So there are pros and cons to both of these. However, what Hanel did was uh, they took some of the trigger elements from this, and they Got the, they got the message that a closed bolt gun was going to be much preferred, and they redesigned their gun to be a closed bolt hammer-fired system, uh, which became the MP43-1. Because once, once you were able to take Hanel's gun, which was less expensive to make, it was simpler, it was far simpler to disassemble, uh, and more reliable. Once you took that, 
and then also gave it a couple of advantages that uh, Walther had had, then you've got the perfect gun overall. And at that point, uh, by late 1941, the, the contract for these guys was cancelled. It is possible that they didn't actually make the full 200, but I don't know that we'll ever be able to find out for sure. Uh, but the guns that still remained were sent back to the Walther factory, where they appear to have stayed until the end of the war. Uh, as a result, these are extremely scarce in Europe, and, well, relatively speaking, more common in the United States. There is in fact a, a rather famous or well-published picture of an American uh, soldier standing in the Walther factory uh, right after the end of the war, uh, smoking and holding and inspecting one of these rifles, and you can see like 15 more of them laying out on a workbench. So. They, these guns stayed at the Walther factory uh, until they were that the Walther factory was liberated by the Americans, and thus most of them that were taken as souvenirs were taken by American soldiers and ended up in the United States. Uh, not to say that they're common in the U.S. They're extremely rare guns everywhere, but uh, it is very cool to have gotten a chance to take a look at this one, to pull it apart, show you how it works. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you uh, do appreciate seeing this sort of thing, please do consider uh, supporting me directly through Patreon. Uh, it is uh, it's support from folks there that makes it possible for me to travel to take up the, the invitation from people like the Maltese Collectors Association to bring these to you guys. Thanks for watching.